Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode of RT Series, a program proposed by Roman Road and Maris World. Roman Road is an art gallery focusing on contemporary and emerging artists. And Maris World, on the other end, is a brand new venture that aims at helping artists and creatives to successfully develop their career through one-on-one -on -one sessions. Soon we will be proposing group sessions and more live events like this one and also short documentaries about artists and creatives. Artist series, so tonight's live event, um, is dedicated to presenting the practice of contemporary artists. Tonight I'm introducing the work of Julia Liosilzon, her latest paintings and her inspiration. We will also discuss the challenging circumstances of 2020 and how Julia is navigated through this year. Julia is an artist who mainly specializes in painting and ceramics. She graduated in 2017 from Slade and 2019 from the RCA. Some of her paintings are currently on, dis on display at the Columbia, which is a creative house and a hotel who, uh, in the west end of London. The Columbia gathers many different creative realities from artist residencies, a gallery, and the artist room where we are sitting tonight. Mm -hmm. Hello, Julia. Thank Hello, you <laughs> for being here. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, you are the first artist that we have shown in the artist room at the Columbia, and you're the first artist to participate in this uh, um, program. So I'm really, I'm really glad to yeah, do this together. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a question um, that's very much um, looking back at 2020 and um, the importance of the artist studio. So for instance, with like uh, throughout the art history, we've seen artists moving out of a studio to go to another one, like Henry Moore went outside of London in the countryside because he needed like more space for his big sculptures. So there is like always the artist trying to adapt to his practice. But with lockdown, everyone had to go back home. And how was it for you? How did you manage? Because you have like quite large format. Yeah. And um, how was it for you? So the studio was always kind of the main space for me. And I never imagined myself working from home. But during COVID, I had to do a lot of works from home. So my home kind of became like my studio, like my kind of creative hub, which was really unusual. And I had to um, navigate myself with the walls and with the spaces, like how I can kind of work in there. So uh, by that time, during lockdown, I was um, preparing for the show in Korea and the works were like massive. I had to make the works like sizes like this ones so approximately like two meters by meter and a half. And it was really challenging because um, the apartment that I live in is a tiny one and I had to work in one of the rooms. <laughs> and like the paintings were kind of almost touching the ceiling. And um, yeah, that was, really, that was really difficult. But at the same time, I realized that I can actually work in any, in any space, in any place. But now when it's kind of um, when my home space is transformed into the studio, for me, it's really difficult to um, to really call home my home because so now it's the studio and um, the works that I was doing there was for the show and they were massive and I had to kind of to look at the works from the angles. Cause the, so your yeah. w the way of painting change. Yeah. So there is uh, not only like a challenge with the size, but also with the depth you can have and yes, looking at, because looking I back at your painting. Yeah, that's that's so true. Because when uh, the lockdown started, I was um, kind of doing all the preparations for the show, 
and I was kind of revisiting my old works and the material I work on. So I really wanted my new ones to be more fluid and to be more honest. And I really wanted the material to kind of to talk for itself. And yeah, in fact, I saw I, like I spent a lot of time in this room, like curating it and then doing the hanging. And then now it's been since the 21st of September that your works are here and I've been coming a few times, let's say. So I, I've, I've spent a lot of time and something that really uh, triggered my attention was like the change of your, like of your, your way of painting and your color palette as well, like from last year, yeah. where it was like colder, yeah. like more blues. Like, in fact, we have two examples in this room. One is time capsule and the other one is red shorts. And both have like this kind of very blue, yeah. cold, white, with touches of red, but the, the, the main thing is cold. Yeah. Whereas now, like your work, they go more into like orange and yellows and like more like warmer colors, um, which I found very interesting as well. So, and there is also more, as you said, like your style has become like more assertive, more free yeah. and more fluid. Yeah. And I, I really, I, I really like, like the way you kind right. of let yourself yeah. go there. Yeah, my work's really shifted because I was really thinking of my color palette. Because for me, colors, it's some kind of comfort zone that I let my viewers to be in. So I was really rethinking my color palette because colors is such a psychological matter and I really wanted my colors to be really inviting, to be really comfortable, especially during lockdown, because this whole kind of period of time was a bit stressful and really uncertain. So I really wanted to have that kind of feel of... Um, reassurance. Reassurance, um, kind of comfort. Um, if you may um, say, uh, naivety. Mm -hmm. So that it's kind of childish, but not in a matter of kind of like trivial things, but in a matter of um, kind of psychological kind of comfort. And, and also when we were like just now talking about the fluidity, I remember through one of our conversation, you mentioned the fact the calligraphy element yeah. and the fact like the writing kind of, can you talk about that a bit? Yes, I was, um, I was always interested in calligraphy and the way that um, my paintings are made, I usually plan it beforehand. And I really want them to look really, really easy and really fluid and really kind of watercolor. Accessible, kind of yeah. Accessible. And calligraphy is, um, is kind of my main kind of fundamental thing that I base my works on, because it really helps me to, um, to think of the projection of this like massive paintings and it really helps me to divide it bits by bits and also for me it's important with a kind of calligraphical marks to simplify some of the things like for example if um, if it's the palm tree I kind of make the simplified mark of it so it's just a reference of it so it's a bit kind of abstract but at the same time the calligraphy makes it really fluid. Yeah, here in the room we have two paintings that I find a very good example of your, uh, your, your painting becoming even like more abstract. So these are quite busy, but we have two. One is um, high heels and the other one was uh, like, no, the cake eater that the we don't eater, have here. Yeah. So those two are very similar in a way in the composition. They're very simple and I think they're some of the most like one the most successful you've done this year yeah. and and um, and you were saying like when we discussed about those two and the idea of calligraphy and the idea of abstraction almost through these paintings yeah. that you were like really looking back and Jap Japanese cartoons yes can you like yes yeah, so um, so when I was looking at animation at Japanese cartoons at some all Japanese cartoons, especially after Second World War, like the propaganda cartoons. I really liked this kind of flatness of the animation and um, the way it was drawn. Mm. Like it was really kind of 
dividing the page on different bits. So I think there's two paintings, the high heel and the cake eater. There is the snake. There's the snake and the snake acts like the provider for the kind of like different parts of the painting. So I can show kind of like the different emotion kind of before the snake and um, yeah, there was like, I'm, I'm going to take it in front of me, but there is like, I remember there was like, uh, I've got it here. So yeah, there is, there is so much going on when you see like the, the guy with his nose and then the yeah. guy in the middle, like being very suspicious yeah. and being behind the snake. It's, it's really interesting yeah. to have like, like so many basically things going on with like three people and just the division of that yeah. black mark because it really helps me to highlight the whole kind of um, episode that's happening on this painting. Because usually when I make paintings, they usually act like the cartoon for mm -hmm. me. I usually put, like not the single one, I usually work on a multiple canvases at the same time. So the calligraphical aspect and animational aspect is the fundamental one in my work. Yeah, so you do it like, uh, yeah, like, like one here, one, one, one scene, two scenes, three scenes, yeah. and then they just kind of... So it's like cartoon strip along the wall. And so this is one of your, um, of your influences. Another thing you said uh, when we talked back in May, I yeah. think, we had like a phone call in May, <laughs> and you were saying that the positive of this, the lockdown one, was that you had the opportunity to do a lot of research and kind of catch up with books and uh, documentaries you've been like willing to watch for a long time and never have time because when it's normal time yeah. it's just busier so um, i um that like that conversation we had like made me under like made me reflect back on the importance actually of research in an artist development and yeah. practice because may, like sometimes we forget that like a painter doesn't just paint but to paint he needs to find inspiration and inspiration is not always just looking through the window or walking in a park it is that as well but it's also reading books and hearing what other people have researched and especially um, when you look at um, uh, art schools yeah. Like there is a big part of the curriculum that is theory and research. So how do you feel now, like basically like seven, six months later, having had time to do some research? Yeah. What are your other inspirations and, and references that you've developed? Um, so um, I was really, I mean, I was quite sad that all my shows have been cancelled during the lockdown, but at the same time I was quite happy, so I finally had some spare time to, um, to watch some um, documentaries. I watched amazing documentaries about like different artists, about musicians, about Frank Sinatra. I watched um, a lot of movies um, to sort of, to kind of soak up this kind of emotions and information and different kind of senses so that I could really kind of burst that kind of out on my paintings. I was also looking at um, some cartoons, some Studio Ghibli cartoons, just to get this kind of sense of color, because it's really important in my work. And from that, I think, I really moved into doing different kind of color palette paintings. So I was, um, I was really grateful for that. And, um, and, and, and. Um, what was your favorite, uh, one of your favorite? I remember you mentioned one, I can't remember which one though. It was, um, so like some movies that I watched was like old Tarkovsky movies was the one with Vincent, Vincent Cassel, Monroy, uh, yeah. Monroy. And um, I was really kind of filling myself with all the information about like current situation, about different social issues, because my work, it's, it's a bit social because it's like, it's part of me. And I really want my viewers to see some kind of hints and hints and different symbols in my work from the current. There like, is a situation. lot of symbolism in your yes. in your work. Yeah, I really like that because it really um, kind of 
speaks for itself. And also, do you think that like the research that like that you have had the chance to to do this year um, grounded your practice more? Like, um, you know, I always think of. Um, and maybe it's just a statement I'm making and it's it's not true, <laughs> but I just always look like that question that comes back all over again is like what's an artist and what makes the difference between someone yeah. that paints and someone that makes that a job. Yeah. And I, I, there is most certainly like an aspect of talent and, you know, but there is also an aspect of rigorous research and whether that comes as a premise of making the work or that comes later as a reading of the work and even if it's not the artist di directly but someone else that can step back and look at the body of work and start analyzing it with like with some kind of um, um, reference back to the artistry yeah. that was written and that that makes a big difference it's not yeah. just making works that reflect on you and just your personality and just an art therapy you yeah. know it can be that as well but yeah. then that will be analyzed yeah. so there is so much um uh, like yeah so much importance in like researching yeah. and understanding what has been done before as well yeah like especially with my works it's really kind of heavily research based before approaching the large scale works, I make a lot of sketches and I have these log books where I just do my drawings because it's so immediate. It's so kind of at the moment. Sometimes when I have this moment of like, um, when I really need to pencil down some thoughts because I do some writing as well before approaching the painting so that I think about kind of, it's kind of different levels of, um, kind of symbols and different levels of like understanding. I have to do a lot of sketches. I have to do a lot of drawings. And only then I approach my painting. So there are two kinds of research. There is the practical research, yeah. like drawing and like practice. And then on the other end, there's a more theoretical research and grounding. Yeah. Thinking of which, it brings me back to my um, last uh, question, which is, now going inside the frame of your painting and like what they are about and um, and the, the material that you use and something that again like by just sitting in front of your painting and staring at them for a moment I just started to feel uncomfortable yeah so at the very beginning I remember coming to your studio a year ago yeah a year ago yeah. like now <laughs> briefly and I entered your studio was like this kind of time on the yeah, probably a that. Thursday night mm -hmm. and I came rushed like five minutes but I just came in and I looked at the work and I was really taken by it just by you know kind of the dance of the 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 figure that are on your paintings and your ceramics were absolutely amazing and very impressive. I, I think I was most impressed by the ceramic then. And um, and yeah, and then when I received these new, these new works in this room and I was looking at them and I'm like, because I've been asked also to display like works that are quite festive yeah. and happy. So I was like, oh yeah, Yulia is perfect and the <laughs> birthday cake and all of these celebrations. Yeah. So then they came inside here and then we hung them on the walls and then I started looking at them and I'm like, it's not so happy actually. <laughs> like I was like, it's not really happy and it's so much, there are so many, like so many different emotions yeah. and range of emotions within the same painting. And you kind of like see the difficulties of like inside a family celebration around the cake and everything should be fun but like someone's not happy someone has like a weird like big smile that's yeah. like yeah, un un yeah easy and then um so and, and i found like there is like a lot of you draw you paint a lot of emotions and yeah. it never goes into pathos yeah. which is really nice like yeah. it's not like sad and but it's it's yeah there is movement and yeah. expression and uh and so, yeah, so I wanted, 
you know, maybe if you want to oh talk yes, about absolutely. these two. Oh, yes, absolutely. So when I walked into this room first time, I fell in love with this space. And then I was just thinking about this kind of referencing that came to my mind about the Antonia Canova Three Graces, the Botticelli's Three Graces. And I really wanted to give um, this really kind of cultural reference, some kind of controversial and um, contemporary spin within kind of And my that other one is thoughts. Pink Evening Light. Right. The pink evening light and um, the bow cakes, because it might work. They're kind of about the social issues of um, overconsumption, this kind of overeating, this over emotions. Like you can see this really fake smiles on, on faces. And you can see, like as you said, there's something wrong with them because they're so kind of not real because they absolutely responding to the kind of to the era that we live in, with the social medias and with this kind of fakeness. Yes, yes, and that's what I remember discussing that with you a few weeks ago. It like kind of that mask that you put over your face, yeah, like a veil, veil yeah. of uh, just being happy and smiling when you're in public. And there is something, and some people you can read through them, some you can't, but then that, that clicked in my head and I was like, oh, this is so interesting <laughs> because the material you use is a transparent fabric. Yes. So I was like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. It was really kind of about duality of emotions because the fabric is transparent. So the emotion should be transparent, but at the same time, it acts like the mosquito net. So it kind of, it stops. allows you to see through, but at the same time, it kind of stops you through like penetrating through like going through so i was really kind of blown away by this material when i started working yeah on it's it. like in jungle uh jungle pool with yeah. the girl like kind of like take like it's like a fire kind yeah of doing thing. this but it's like this kind of craziness and yeah and it's it's always i don't know i i i i didn't get it at first when i went to your studio i have to admit yeah. But then, like, yeah, by looking at them here, I was like, wow, it's, it does make sense. How did you find that fabric, by the way? So it was a long way of research. When I was at Slade, I was doing a lot of research and I was just trying out painting on different material because I really wanted to find something that would act like, like the watercolor surface, but not... Um, but not, um, not kind of, um, not cotton, not linen and not paper because I wanted something else. And I was really looking for it in different fabric shops. And I remember then um, that I started kind of painting on some fabric just on the inside of my coat. And it really worked, like something that I was really hoping to get really finally worked. And, um, and I was really happy about that. And then it was like ages of this heavy research into like, where can I get this fabric from? Because I really wanted to get this fluidity. And the jungle pool painting, um, I actually started it on the floor. Because when I, st I start all my paintings on the floor, so that it gives me the surface to really bring in some marks so that they look like watercolor. And it really, kind of it's really interesting how different painting looks when it's kind of down and yeah. how then it looks when it's up so it's kind of two different paintings for me and when I was making this whole kind of series because I always make my uh, works within the series like for the New York show I did the series like Paradesos for this room I uh, like for the artist room I uh, really decided to do kind of the series so that they really kind of click with each other because it's really important for me so that all the paintings they have this kind of weird connection and yeah, dialogue. Yeah, also they are like uh, there was high heel and uh, jungle pool and then this one the pink evening light and the bow is it the bow cakes like these two are like more feminine and yeah. the other two are like very masculine in a way. Cause it's they're interesting, really, yeah. like the, dia the dialogue between them. Yeah. Like it's like it's completely different worlds. Yeah, it's also like the sides, the kind of the uh, kind of feminine side and more kind of masculine side. And I try to kind of 
to jump on this too and try to kind of balance them out. And I think uh, it worked perfectly for this room. Yeah. And uh, especially with these themes of like overconsumption, these themes of like kind of fakeness, this theme of uh, like really kind of um, kind of bright colors. Um, I think it really worked well with this kind of classic ambiance. Yeah, no, it did. In here, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. We, at the end of our uh, four questions, Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Columbia for hosting the artist room and this event. Um, we have done a catalog, uh, a digital catalog that uh, contains um, e um, an essay by Hector Campbell and an interview. And so that link, we don't have it there actually. I forgot to put it on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you can DM me on either Roman Road or My Mary's World on Instagram or Yulia and we will send you the link yeah, with to the catalog <laughs> which has the, all the, um, the paintings reproduced, the essay and the interview. So a full on uh, <laughs> yeah. summary of uh, Yulia. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing, Maurice. So thank you so thank much you. for having me here. No, it's uh, it's a pleasure, especially during this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes us do something different. Yes, that's amazing. Cool. Bye. Bye. <laughs>